Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Palalonis, and I'm the director of the Center for Emerging Media Design and Development here at Ball State University. Joining me is Dr. Kevin Maloney, an associate professor teaching in our Master of Arts degree in EMDD. Hello, uh, it's nice to uh, nice to have you join us from out there. We also have one EMD we also have one EMDD graduate student and one current student joining us today. Brandy Geister is a user experience product designer who graduated from our on-campus program, and Spencer Osborne, a web designer and digital marketing strategist who will graduate this spring from our low residency program. So Kevin and I are going to begin by talking generally about our program. EMDD is a two-year master's degree program that focuses on strategic communication through three main areas. The first is design thinking, the second transmedia storytelling, and the third user experience. It's important to understand these topics as they kind of serve as the pillars of our degree program. So Kevin, let's start by spending a little bit of time uh, defining these a little bit more for our audience. First, design thinking is a process for solving problems by prioritizing audience or customer needs above all else. So it's a user-centered process that relies on observing with empathy how people interact with their environments and tools, and it employs an iterative, hands-on approach to creating innovative solutions. Design thinking actually originated uh, in project, uh, product design uh, as a method for designing and developing products based on people's needs. Um, design thinking is a process that includes empathy research, uh, defining, and, uh, uh, defining problems and opportunity spaces, and ideating solutions, prototyping ideas, and then testing those ideas with real audiences. So in EMDD, students get to learn to use this process to explore problem and opportunity spaces that might benefit from innovative storytelling uh, to meet audiences where they are. Second is transmedia storytelling. So, you know, what the, the way we define transmedia storytelling is designing a story to unfold across multiple media channels, analog, digital, and even brick and mortar in an expansive rather than redundant way. So basically, a story spreads across the mediascape rather than only existing in one place or repeating itself over and over. Each piece of that story adds to the others, no matter in what medium you might find it. You can think of the way massive entertainment franchises like Star Wars or the Marvel Cinematic Universe work, or political campaigns, complex ad campaigns, and even ancient mythologies. In EMDD, we often use these techniques to communicate solutions to real world problems. So for example, how do we tell stories that help us solve some of the problems that we're gonna talk about later on in this webinar in the second year projects we do in the program. Third, if you're going to use design thinking to understand audiences and build these sort of large scale cross-platform stories for them, how can you be sure that what you're building is actually resonating with an audience? So that's where user experience comes in. We teach our students all kinds of practical research methods that can be used to test ideas and prototype various uh, uh, strategies and solutions at different stages in the design process. So in the first year of our program, you'll take courses that focus on these three topics, uh, along with uh, other cutting edge story forms and platforms like augmented and virtual reality, app and web design, and more. Finally, we focus on lots of high level professional skills that create a, like creative, creative problem solving, collaborative teamwork, and project management, just to name a few. Yeah, it's also worth noting that EMDD curriculum is typically driven by real world projects. So we love to connect our students with companies and organizations in the real world with real projects that allow those students to practice what they're learning for actual audiences. And in the second year of our program, you'll learn that nearly all of your credit hours working on one large collaborative project come to play. Over the years, our students have worked with 
uh, organizations like the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra or Indiana Public Media. We've partnered with the Professor Garfield Foundation and USA Volleyball, for example, and even Ball State's most famous alumnus, David Letterman. It's also worth noting that EMDD is an interdisciplinary program that attracts people from all different backgrounds, from designers and writers to individuals with undergraduate and professional experience in business, art, computer science, psychology, sociology, anthropology, and more. Uh, Kevin and I get asked this question all the time, you know, who should apply for EMDD? And we often say that really our program is open to anyone. So if you take anything away from today's webinar, please know that EMDD really does work to uh, add skills on top of your existing skill set regardless of your background. So Kevin, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about uh, the two different delivery options for EMDD. We have both an on-campus program, which provides a pretty typical residential experience, and a low residency program, which is primarily online with one small twist. Students in our online program uh, attend classes in, in uh, sorry, students in our on-campus program uh, attend classes in person, typically live in Muncie, Indiana, where the Ball State campus is located. Uh, and they often fund their studies through graduate assistantships. Uh, I know many of our viewers are probably interested in those types of assistantships. Uh, there are many across campus, and EMDD students are often very attractive candidates for, uh, because they have the media skills that, that a lot of different divisions on campus are looking for. So once you're accepted to EMDD, incoming students receive information regularly about graduate assistant openings and how to apply for a graduate assistance, uh, assistantship. Uh, Brandy, since you graduated from the on-campus uh, program, we'd love to hear from you. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I went to Ball State for uh, my undergrad. I was majoring in journalism with a concentration in graphics. So most of the classes that I took in my undergrad were graphic design based, learning how to use like visual hierarchy, color theory, fonts, et cetera, and putting those skills to use mostly in a you know, print platform. So my junior year of college, I it was one of our requirements to take a like introduction to coding course. So this course taught us the basics of like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and that pretty much changed the trajectory of my career, my life after that. Um, I fell in love with it, so I wanted to teach myself more and more and more. I took an independent study and taught myself how to use like more complex code um, to build larger projects, um, and that's where I really started getting interested in user experience design and in interaction design. And so as my time at Ball State was coming to an end, I decided to you know, take a look into what grad school could offer me so that I can continue that interest in a stable learning environment. Um, so that's really what my background looks like here at Ball State and what led me into EMDD. So, you know, this is a university with a lot of different graduate options. Why did you choose EMDD? Yeah, so my professor at the time who was teaching that coding course suggested it. She had a graduate assistant who was assisting her in the classroom, and I got to see firsthand how, you know, the class environment, you know, was really great for that particular student, and I was more interested in it, started asking more questions, and then I started to meet with Jen and Kevin and some of our other faculty members and it just kind of fell into place for me and it was a natural fit and a natural progression from where I was. So Brandy, you now currently have a pretty big, big job um, as, as a designer and mm -hmm. uh, user experience uh, specialist. Can you talk a little bit about how EMDD prepared you for that particular job? Yeah, so I currently work for Ball State as an instructional design consultant for the Lifetime Learning Initiative here on campus. Um, I work with a lot of the professors on campus to turn their courses into an interactive, non-credit training course. Um, so I do a lot of prototyping, a lot of graphic design, coding, and web development as well. Um, EMDD, I think, is the only reason why I actually have that job. Um, you know, they were able to give me a safe space to practice project management, and that's a huge skill in my job set. 
um, and being able to have team building in a professional environment. It also gave me tools for critical thinking and problem solving, and it also gave me a really great network of like-minded individuals, regardless of what our backgrounds came from. What was your favorite part about EMDD? <laughs> was, it, was it the curriculum, or was it your fellow students, or how so, did that work? So, yeah, um, I think EMDD gave us a great wide variety of projects and classes. Um, my favorite was our second year project uh, for EMDD. It was working on the David Letterman learning experience. So the David Letterman project is a project-based immersive learning experience that started in 2018. Um, it's an immersive student-led storytelling experience that uses David Letterman as its focal point. So students complete a number of cutting-edge project, cutting product using technology um, and storytelling and augmented reality and a lot more. Um, so I was part of that project from January 2021 to May 2022. And our team was able to work hand in hand with David Letterman on a transmedia storytelling and design thinking project. And it was so cool to be able to present our projects directly to David Letterman and be able to get that feedback from him. It was so meaningful to be able to work with somebody and have a project that actually meant something. So that was easily my favorite part of being in EMDD. Thank you, Brandy. So yeah. Kevin, can you talk a little bit about the structure of our low residency program and explain what exactly low residency means? Yeah, so low residency is an interesting term. And what we do is we have an online program that also brings students to campus for about four days at the start of every semester. So no matter where they live, we've had students from Wales and South Korea join us in this program. And they fly in and we get everybody like Spencer and his cohort together personally in uh, a centralized space on, on our campus in Fishers, Indiana. And we work with them intensely for multiple hours each day for four days. And the advantage of what this, this brings is that they get to know each other really well. They collaborate fluidly. They become a cohort. They become good friends which is a bit of a rarity in an online learning program. But, you know, there are occasionally through the semester times when we'll still meet on Zoom or together online so we can reconnect and discuss assignments. But largely, after those first four days, the rest of the semester is entirely an online space. And it's really designed to help entry-level or mid-career working professionals manage to get this degree while they're still working their jobs or raising a family or leading their other complex pieces of their lives from wherever they happen to be. So it's designed to not uproot you so much as an on-campus program might, but it also seeks to give you the same interpersonal relationships that you would get on campus. So Spencer, since you're a member of that current low residency cohort, tell us a little bit about your experience. Well, um I studied public relations at Ball State and graduated with my undergrad in 2011. And then I followed my partner Kristen to Huguenot, um, New York, and we lived and worked at the YMCA of Greater New York Sleepaway Camp and as a communications coordinator and I did web uh, work. And then her career brought us back to Indiana uh, where we lived at Flat Rock River YMCA Camp uh, in St. Paul. We got married, I got a job at Liberty Fund, uh, marketing the books and some of the web content, and then I decided to pursue my master's, uh, so I started the EMDD program, and I got a job at Ball State in the marketing and communications division. Flat Rock, my, my kid took a field trip there, I think in seventh grade. It's kind of interesting sets of connections, how all of these paths cross. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so Spencer, again, as a communications professional, you had lots of options for a master's degree. You said you studied PR in your undergrad. Right. Um, you know, certainly there are PR master's programs. Um, why did you choose EMDD? What, what was the motivating factor there? Well, when I was an undergrad at Ball State, I took a transmedia class. And for the class, I pitched the idea of developing my own website for, and to get class credit. And I remember that the instructor agreed to that proposition almost too easily. It made me feel a little uncomfortable <laughs> that it was just yes right away. 
Um, but I think being able to do my own project and get class credit at the same time really made an impression, and I think that's why originally I was interested to look into EMDD. Yeah, There's it's so okay. many ways to get real world <laughs> experience and just like adapt it to what you're interested in. And that's one thing I'd like to just for our viewers um, maybe maybe point out. You know, as a project based program, we do work really hard to make sure that regardless of whether you're in the first year of the program or in the second year of the program, which is really intensely project-based, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Everything you do in EMDD, we, we do with a real audience in mind. And I think the practicality of that is really attractive, especially at the graduate level. You know, Kevin and I often talk about the fact that, you know, in grad school, just doing assignments that the professor sees that you get a grade on and then you just move on to the next assignment is really not all that useful. Um, to somebody who already has an undergraduate degree and, and possibly some professional experience under the, their belt, the more meaningful learning experience is one that really allows you to practice the skills that you're currently learning in the context of a real world project or a real world problem solving space. Um, and so we work really hard to make sure that students not only get to work in those project based environments, but also get to you know, pitch their own passion projects as um, uh, potential projects or even projects that they're doing for their employer can somehow enter our classroom and become a part of that learning experience. So we're pretty proud of the fact that we give students those, those kinds of opportunities. Yeah, I'm kind of also curious, Spencer. So you mentioned, you know, how that original class kind of connected to pieces of your real life. So how has what you've been studying for the last year and a half in EMDD filtered back to your job that you currently have? Well, we learned um, empathy research yeah. to start with empathy, and that teaches us that other people have valuable insights to share about their experiences that we can use to inform our work. So in EMDD, I learned that I, it has helped me with my work and to, to design from the perspective of our users and those that we're trying to serve. So one recent project that comes to mind is the redesign of the graduate admissions pages, uh, which could be described as a wicked problem. <laughs> um, there's a dozens of related pages with lots of important information, and to organize that information, we absorbed all of the pages, about 175 or so, into a single page with one massive dropdown. Um, so the EMDD coursework helped me uh, build the skills necessary to execute a project like that and to think of things from the user's perspective. Cool, so you know, so far what's the thing you like best about EMDD? And I know the answer is us, but you <laughs> know, right, right. beyond <laughs> Jen and Kevin, what? Uh, uh, in EMDD 660, I got to enhance my in applied uh, research skills and wrote a paper on um, the effects of awe, which was just fascinating. Um, also in EMDD 640, uh, I learned to develop transmedia storytelling to make a transmedia story world, and that envisions uh, media that plays out over a lar or a large-scale story that plays out over media that's delivered across several different platforms. So um, I think being able to pitch my own passion project uh, as a year two project um, for the Remnant Trust, and I had several um, classmates join me in that effort, and so it was really exciting to be able to kind of that memory you know from my undergrad of being able to pitch an idea and to follow through with it i feel like that happened again and in, in, in the real program and so it's been super exciting to be able to work on something that's so directly connected with my own interests yeah you know that project has been a really fascinating and fun one so spencer is on a team working with the Remnant Trust, which is an organization that has a huge collection of really ancient books that influence our ideas of freedom and liberty and personal, you know, ethical foundations. And they are starting with Spencer and another classmate back in our transmedia storytelling class and our design thinking class too. They started determining how they could better help this organization communicate with a younger audience that doesn't normally, we don't normally think of as putting their hands on dusty leather bound old tomes. And how do we bring that experience of awe back into the digital space? And they've been doing a really fabulous job with that. It's, it's really fun and intriguing. And I'm so excited about where this project has been going. Yeah, I would have to mention another 
things, just the people involved in EMDD has always been, it's been really great compared to other classes I've been in. People tend to get very close, and so, so many of my classmates and professors have become such good friends. So I would say that stands out as well. I'd agree with that, definitely. <laughs> So Kevin mentioned earlier when he was talking about the low res program that one of the reasons we created it is because we recognize there's a there's a lot an audience of folks out there that is interested in maybe a master's degree or a certificate or just improving their skills in um, storytelling and, and cross platform storytelling communication design thinking all of the areas that we focus on but they also might be you know let's face it mid career professionals who aren't going to quit their day jobs to go back to school full time or who have you know, lives, work, family, careers. And so one of the motivations for us in building this low residency program is really to try to meet students where they are and give you, uh, you know, potentially a, a more flexible um, approach to earning the degree. So Spencer, can you talk a little bit about how the low res program has kind of helped you balance work, life, career, all of, you know, all of those things? Yeah, um, so getting a master's degree would not have been possible for me without the low residency option. I've got two young kids and one on the way, so I'm usually, a lot of my time at home is chasing them around. <laughs> um, so th I find the low residency option to really be the best of both worlds because the workshops and the um, opportunities to come to the EMDD lab in person gives you that interpersonal um, connection um, but even though most of the co coursework is able to be done online at your own discretion whenever you need. Um, so I feel like it's such a great balance of both. Yeah, great. So we're often asked how long it takes to complete the EMDD program. Of course, the answer depends on how many classes you take each semester. Uh, the EMDD program is 33 to 36 hours, kind of depending on how you put your coursework together, and there are some options for that. Um, we often talk, though, in terms of sort of part-time students versus full-time students. Um, and regardless, if there are a couple of paths through the program, but we can get you through in two years, regardless of whether you're a part-time or a full-time student. So this is kind of what that looks like. Part-time students typically, typically take two classes each semester for six semesters. So they go fall, spring, and summer for two years. So two classes at a time, fall, spring, and summer. Um, this allows them to complete the program in two years, but also kind of lighten the load and spread the coursework out over uh, several semester semesters. Our full-time students, who are typically our on-campus students, although we often have also on-campus students who do the part-time option, um, take three classes each semester, fall and spring. Um, and then full-time students usually finish in two years as well, uh, but they take the summer in between years one and two to complete an internship or maybe do some relevant work uh, rather than taking classes. So in general, we're pretty flexible and we can work with you to design a plan of study that works for you. So although we like to think of EMDD as a two-year program, uh, we occasionally have students who come to us and say, can I take longer than two years? You know, can I spread it out a little bit more than that so I have that flexibility? And of course, the answer is yes. Um, I meet with each student every semester to talk about their plan of study, to make adjustments to their plan of study, and to provide that kind of advising. Um, so, so yeah, in general, I think that we have uh, quite a bit of flexibility. Yeah, and another uh, question that we often get is what's the outcome for students who complete the program? You know, there's no job description, as Jen is often quoted as saying, for emerging media designer and developer. This fits in a lot of different places. So our students can tailor the degree, particularly the low residency option, to their own interests. And we bring those real world pieces of people's lives into the projects we do, into the coursework, so that there's immediate relevance to what they're up to. And we encourage connections with career so that what you're doing in school advances what you're doing in your work life for all of our students, whether they're on campus or in that low residency program. And you know, the job students will get you know, uh, tend to lean towards usability and user experience, but we also have former students who are transmedia storytellers and others working for organizations and agencies that do a lot of design thinking. So they're graduating into any of our three pillars and usually mixing them up and applying them to another new and interesting industry. 
So it's very flexible. I would also add, we have a fair number of students, especially in recent years, who've graduated and gone on to be uh, project managers and product mm -hmm. uh, managers for uh, various companies, um, either in, you know, sort of uh, app design, development, user experience, or in media companies, um, you know, increasingly traditional media companies are looking at ways to be more innovative as well and exploring different innovative storytelling um, strategies and options. One of the things I often say, though, when people ask me that question about, like, what kind of a <laughs> job am I going to get, um, I often respond with this thought. What industry or field in 2023 and beyond is not looking for people who can tell stories across platforms, who can understand audiences, who can solve problems through storytelling and by sort of filling the information gap? Um, really, when you think about it, every sector of our economy is, uh, you know, sort of um, filled with fields and businesses and companies and, and, and career paths that where, where these types of skills are applicable. So we will often see students going into healthcare, education, media, um, you know, and even the business sector working uh, in communications. Um, one thing we also forgot to mention is that we do a fair amount of social media um, mm -hmm. storytelling. So, you know, how can you leverage social media as a storytelling tool? How can you effectively leverage social media to promote your products and projects, to engage with audiences and customers, and, you know, to, to sort of stay in that, that dialogue with audience? Um, so all of these skills, in addition to a lot of cutting edge technologies, are um, brought into play. Um, another question I often get, how do I apply, right? So if you're interested in applying to EMDD, it's sort of a, a two-step process. Uh, you have to apply to Ball State University. Um, obviously, that uh, requires transcripts. Um, international students may have a few additional, um, you know, items that ha have to be uh, submitted. We do not require the GRE. Kevin and I are strong believers that we would much rather um, talk to you about your skills and, and see work that allows you to demonstrate what you're good at rather than take some kind of standardized test. So no GRE required, yay. Um, and then once you've applied to the graduate school at Ball State University, you will also in your application indicate that you're interested in applying to EMDD. And we have a few additional things that we require. One is a creative portfolio. Now, students ask us all the time, what do I put in my portfolio? And because we have the word design in our title, students often will say, I'm not a designer. I don't know what to put in a, a portfolio. And I'll give you a couple of, piece of pieces of advice about a creative portfolio. One, don't overthink it. Um, <laughs> Kevin and I are really looking for you to demonstrate to us what you're good at. So we've had all kinds of submissions over the years. Of course, if you're a designer like Brandy, you might submit graphic design work. If you're a writer, you might submit uh, writing uh, samples. Um, but we've had students submit business plans. We've had uh, computer science uh, uh, students submit code. Uh, we've had fine art students submit uh, uh, examples of fine art. Kevin, you want to tell them a little bit about our quilter? Yeah, so we've had quilts submitted to our, as, as samples for a portfolio by somebody who ended up bringing that piece of her life into EMDD really deeply as a, as a uh, craftivist, which means that, you know, how can you use really traditional crafts like quilting, for example, to help change the world too? And it was super fun. We get photography, we get all kinds of things, but business plans. Yeah, business plans. Like Jen was saying, what we're really looking for is for you to tell us who you are and what makes you tick. The other thing I will say about the portfolio, sometimes hear por people hear portfolio and they're kind of intimidated, like, oh gosh, it, gosh it's going to be this really big thing. Mm -hmm. We're really only looking for two or three samples. So mm -hmm. don't overdo it. You know, Pick two or three things that you think really demonstrate your talent, who you are, what you're interested in. They can be all of the same vein. So it could be all photography or it could be some photography, some design work, some writing, a business plan, an advertising <laughs> campaign whatever you uh, whatever you think you're good at. Um, we also require a resume or a curriculum vita, um, a thousand word roughly statement of purpose. Um, really the statement of purpose is, is very similar to what you would write for a cover letter. Why do you want to come to EMDD? What interests you about our program? 
what, ma what makes you think um, EMDD is a right fit for you and you are a right fit for the program. And then finally, um, a, a lengthier writing sample. Now, of course, on the website, it's going to say 2,500 to 5,000 word writing sample. We're not counting the words. <laughs> what we really want to see uh, is a demonstration of your writing skills. It is a master's degree program, and there will be some writing that happens. And so we just want to be able to evaluate your writing skills. Um, the other thing I will say about those, those pieces if you have any questions at all, if you want any advice at all, if you want to bounce ideas with someone about what you might include in your portfolio, feel free to reach out to Kevin or I. We're absolutely always thrilled to talk to prospective students and give you some insight. So don't feel like you have to do this alone in a vacuum with no help. If you would like to chat about it, just reach out to us and we will be more than happy to, um, to give you some advice. So much of this information is available on our website, uh, which can be found uh, by visiting and searching EMDD online. Um, if you go to the Ball State website, for example, and search EMDD, you'll find our homepage relatively quickly. And again, you're welcome to uh, reach out to us with any questions. Our project manager is Matt Lowe, and he is also a great uh, resource for questions, uh, answering questions. So now we have a few moments here, since this is a, a live webinar, to actually engage with our audience and answer some questions. So hopefully you've been um, submitting questions if you have them. Certainly you're welcome to submit questions right now. And I see that we actually have a question from our audience. So um, one of those is, how soon should I apply? So you know we're in January right now. Uh, the fall semester begins in August. Um, we don't often have students who start in the summer semester, um, but it is an option. So uh, the question of how soon I should apply, uh, apply is, is pretty simple. Uh, Ball State actually, we have a rolling acceptance um, uh, process. So we will accept applications up until exactly two weeks before the start of the semester. Um, so uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the exact date for fall start is, but it's usually right around August 24th, 25th, so 25th somewhere <laughs> in there. So two weeks before that um, is when you'll want to apply for the program. And uh, that will ensure you know, you'll, you'll still get considered. I will say, however, our program has been growing exponentially every year. Um, we are very fortunate in that each year we have more and more applicants to the program. And we do accept people on a rolling basis, which means if we receive an application today, we don't wait till August to evaluate it. Kevin and I will evaluate it today. And within two or three days, you'll get an answer about whether you're in. The only drawback to a rolling uh, application program is that uh, that means we could potentially fill up. So if you find yourself interested in EMDD, I would say apply sooner rather than later, even if you haven't fully made your decision yet. Um, that way you get in the pipeline, you uh, get your application considered, and we can make a decision on your admission um, you know, sooner rather than later. Yeah, we, we always want to preserve the quality of what our program is doing. So there are limits to how many students we can take at a time. So we might bump into that. So. I second that you should apply as soon as you're confident you're ready to go. So we have another question here. The question is, the way it's worded is, do BSU undergrads need to apply in the same way? This is a great question. So one thing we haven't talked about that I can kind of touch on briefly is we have an accelerated master's degree program here at Ball State. Now, our viewers who are not Ball State students currently, um, this won't apply to you. But if you are currently a Ball State undergraduate student, you do have the option to apply to our accelerated master's degree program. In a nutshell, what that means is you can actually start taking graduate classes before you finish your undergraduate degree. And you can earn up to 12 credit hours of graduate credit while you're still an undergrad, nine of which can count toward both degrees. So the accelerated master's degree program is an amazing opportunity because essentially what it does it, is a, it allows students to pretty much knock out the first year of their master's degree program uh, before finishing their undergrad. You pay undergraduate tuition for the graduate courses, 
and we substitute the nine of those 12 hours toward your bachelor's degree as well. So essentially, you're knocking out a, a half of your master's degree with no extra credit hours. Then in the second year, you become a full-time grad student and you can complete the remainder of the master's degree program. The other benefit there is in the second year, because you're a full-time grad student, now you uh, 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 qualify for a graduate assistantship. And assuming you land a graduate assistantship, you end up um, completing the second year of your program for free. Graduate assistance, just so all of you know, whether you're an AMP student or whether you're coming in as a full-time grad student, if you get a graduate assistantship, it covers uh, most of your tuition. There are a few fees that students have to pay. Um, and it pays you a stipend of roughly $13,000 a year. So at the end of the day, a, a graduate assistantship is a wonderful way not only to fund your graduate studies, but also um, you know, to get some valuable work experience while you're going through the program. We have another question about the details in our required in-person element for our low residency program. And first I'd like to say we try to be extremely flexible, <clears throat> particularly with our low residency students so that you can manage this degree. We're a program in empathy. We try to be very empathetic. So, for example, if you applied to our low residency program and had difficulty in any given semester getting to that low residency workshop, you're free to talk to us and we'll see if we can work out a solution for you. We're not going to flunk you out because you can't come to something ever in the program. We, wanna, we are here to help you succeed. So we'll work with you and there are usually possibilities for that. However, I have to say that our low, our low residency programs workshops every semester are the secret sauce. They're the thing that makes these cohorts really tick and makes the program fun, so I can't recommend them enough. And most of our students have had success in the past speaking to their employers or their spouses and so forth to make sure that they can be available uh, for those four days three times a year um, so that we can, we can make that work. What usually happens in that workshop is we do a lot of field work. So for all of the classes that we teach, we'll have an element during the workshop where we may go visit an organization that we're working on a project with. We will go study museums, we will study uh, exhibition spaces, we will develop experiences because we have the time available to do that. And that way we can get a lot of those hands-on pieces of our puzzle to the students and then spend the rest of the semester online, which is much more flexible. The other thing I would add about the low res workshop, just you know, for more of the logistics um, uh, side of that question, um, typically we start, it's, it's always the very first week of the semester. So for us here at Ball State, that was last week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we had our workshop at, at, at Launch Fishers last week. Um, and we usually start on Wednesday around two o'clock. Uh, and we go kind of into the evening. We usually have dinner together that evening and, and kind of kick things off from about 2 to 7 p.m. on that Wednesday of the first week of the semester. We go all day Thursday, all day Friday, and all day Saturday. So we try to kind of push it toward the end of the week so folks who work full time can uh, don't have to be away from work too long. And, and typically that works out, as Kevin said, pretty well with our low res students and their employers. Um, we also had a, a question about our project teams, and I, I wanted to, we'd be remiss if we didn't spend just a couple minutes talking about how cool our projects here at uh, EMDD are. Um, so when EMDD was created several years ago, one of the goals in our program was to really create an immersive project experiential learning environment where um, students really kind of spend the first year of the program learning all of the core skills in design thinking, transmedia storytelling, project management, usability, user experience, um, all of those things that, that really make EMDD tick. And then in the second year, uh, you earn pretty much all of your credit hours in project work. So every student has the opportunity in the spring semester to hear from the faculty the pitches for next year's projects. And those projects run the entire academic year. So in your second year of the program, you'll earn nine credit hours over two semesters working on one large real world project 
with a group of your classmates. Typically the teams are anywhere from three to six or seven students, depending on the project and depending on the interests of students and run by uh, one of the faculty. So Kevin and I, for example, are running our project teams this year. And again, those projects are in collaboration with a real organization. So Spencer talked a little bit about his project team working on Remnant Trust. Um, Brandy talked about her project. She was on the David Letterman Learning Team and worked directly with David Letterman. Uh, we've also worked with USA Volleyball. We've created now two um, original documentaries uh, looking at the rise of boys and men's volleyball in uh, minority and underserved populations across the United States. Um, we've worked in collaboration with the men's Olympic team and the Olympic coach, so there was travel involved, lots of really cool excitement in sports and entertainment and storytelling there. Uh, we've worked with Jim Davis, the creator of Garfield the Cat, um, to develop a digital literacy curriculum for kids in grades K through 5, as well as a digital literacy training uh, uh, program for teachers who want to improve upon and increase their digital literacy skills. Kevin, you want to talk a little bit about a couple of the projects you've run recently? Yeah, so uh, this year we're working with the Remnant Trust. We also have a project with Ball State Public Media helping a venerable and talented public media broadcast organization expand beyond its traditional channels and find a younger audience. We also have a project working with the author of a children's book on architecture to help take that story and expand it into transmedia space and make interactive STEAM-based activities for kids related to architecture, all with the nicest guy and coolest author you could possibly meet. In prior years, uh, last year, for example, we had a project in Maui where students worked with an organization uh, making efforts to elevate through art and storytelling the, you know, the pride of place in the local population. So native Hawaiians and people who were born and raised in Hawaii are of a particular interesting and rich culture. And that often gets diluted by um, the overload of tourists that come to town. So we worked with them on some storytelling techniques to elevate that sense of pride and community and make connections between people. And the students flew to Hawaii, did some research on the ground, presented their results and launched the project within a two week space at the end of the final semester after having researched deeply and working really hard with those organizations. We've done augmented reality based game storytelling for the Indianapolis Symphony to help them also look towards a younger audience and to tell the hidden stories of classical music in really fun and entertaining ways. We have made podcasts related to science fiction. We've done about everything you can think of so far. I mean, we've touched upon it and we're open for, for far more. Yeah, and I would say, you know, you're probably hearing travel is, is a, a component of some of our projects. The farthest we've gone is Rome. Uh, in 2017, we had a team of students that worked with a nonprofit journalism group who covers the water and energy crisis globally. They built a global social media campaign around the value of water, collected over 27 story, uh, over 800 stories from 27 countries around the world, and our work was uh, picked up and recognized by the Vatican and Pope Francis, who were at the time. Uh, running a world water uh, workshop and initiative um, through the Vatican and our students were invited to Rome to the Vatican to work behind the scenes and help run a three-day world water workshop and we ran all of the media and social media and storytelling for that so again lots of really cool projects and I think if there's one thing we could leave you with and hopefully you're kind of gathering from our conversation is that it really doesn't matter what background you're from or what sector of it, the the um, the world your professional skills come or where you work the kinds of skills you learn in EMDD are really applicable everywhere so you heard projects that touch on education you've heard projects that touch on entertainment sports uh, we work a lot with nonprofit organizations um, healthcare uh, you know the list goes on and on so uh, we really are proud of the fact that EMDD is an interdisciplinary program that draws people from lots of different backgrounds to solve real-world problems through storytelling. 
So I think that's the end of the questions from our audience, and that is the end of our conversation with you today. So Kevin, Brandy, Spencer, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you to everybody uh, in our audience for joining us today for the webinar. Again, if you have any questions at all about the program, please reach out. Kevin, myself, and our project manager, Matt Lowe, are more than happy to talk to you more about the program. And if you found yourself interested in applying to EMDD, please do so right away. We look forward to seeing your applications. Thank you.